This is a Fender Strut from a Harley Davidson Vroom Vroom, and it needs a hole filled. This one also needs a hole filled after I stick it all back together, but it's actually not that simple. I have to make this break and this crack completely disappear. So first things first, let's identify it. Now many of these parts are sold as billet, and it's important to know what you actually have so you can make the appropriate repair. Now the first sign of it actually being a cast part is found on the back side of the part itself. Now you can see these small pits and pinholes as well as a rough and inconsistent height and finish on it. Now this is indicative of cast parts, almost because nobody finishes the hidden side, which kind of helps keep the cost down. The second indication that this is cast is at the location of the break. Now if you look carefully, the fracture is random as opposed to flowing with a grain. There's also no stretching or elongation of the metal, which would normally be seen on a billet piece. So this is definitely cast. But there is a problem when it comes to this piece. If the entire piece isn't realigned perfectly, it's not going to sit correctly on the bike. And since it holds a fender up, it's going to look really stupid if it comes out crooked. The second thing is it's definitely going to break again if we don't completely remove the crack and leave nothing of the original material in its place. So how do we stick this thing back together in its exact location while completely eliminating all of the original metal around the break? Simple. We follow a process. I'll start this repair off by knocking out this inside corner first. Now the marker helps me decide where to cut before I actually start digging in. It's a nice good visual reference, which I can change in case I need to. Now the most noteworthy part of this inside corner is making sure to cut a pretty large cavity into the body of the part past the point of the crack. Now the reason why we do this is that there is an abundance of fresh metal in place when we go to cut this corner back out after welding. Now if we simply just cut a small groove into it and then whacked it all back down after welding it, it's definitely going to crack again. So we have to fill in a bunch of new fresh metal, which is going to be stronger. On the smaller piece, I ground about a 50% bevel into it with my flat disc and grinder. Now the reason for only taking down half is because I need the mechanical lock of the fracture itself to serve as a natural position memory. This is how we will keep it completely aligned once welding is complete. So after clamping it down to the table, I give it a little shake to ensure that it's located in its original position. I also gave it a good solid 5 minute preheat or so because my welder is going to be running on 110 volt only which limits me to 140 amps output. This should help. Now cast aluminum can be a relatively tricky material to weld because it has several pores contained within the material itself. Those pores combined with residual casting material all combine to create a very annoying byproduct which we often refer to as junk. In order to create a successful weld repair, we first have to run the torch over the top of the casting to push out any junk below the surface. This allows a fresh clean layer of solid aluminum to form which we can then weld to. And this is actually where people screw up a little bit. You have to kind of recast that layer. If you don't have enough torch time running over the top of it, you're still going to have impurities and little pinholes and little things that are not going to make the actual weld bead itself from the fresh metal stick to it. So make sure you take your time and you let all those little bubbles come out of it. Unfortunately, in this camera angle, I didn't get that great of a shot on it, but I did keep on going back and forth and back and forth until all of those little bubbles and everything else like that are gone. Once they're all gone, I know that I have a new solid fresh layer in which to stick new fresh metal to. Once I'm confident that I have that, then I can start stuffing some filler into it. Now I did use a little bit smaller of diameter filler on this one, and that's just so I can control how much deposition I get out of it. So if I have a smaller amount, I can push more filler into it. As opposed to a larger diameter, I cannot control necessarily how much goes in, and how much actually flows versus how much solidifies. So basically too much or not enough, I would like to run with a smaller filler just so I can actually control how much goes in. Now, I should mention that none of these beads are meant to look pretty. They should have some uniformity overall, but the primary purpose is to get them to hold more than anything else. Now, one of the final stages after filling the metal in is to mow it back down. And that basically means that I'm going to go full power on the machine and move the torch back over the bead to make sure it blends in and flows. And with that complete, we can see the result. Now once we cut down the red section back to original condition, the yellow will stay, leaving plenty of fresh metal to hold this piece together. The next step is to get the other side cut out, and I literally mean cut. Now I'm using the cutoff wheel to start with because it will quickly and easily get past the old metal and into the new metal that we just laid down on the other side. Now it is important that you reach the new metal. If you fail to do so, 
you will leave a void in the part. Or if some of the crack still remains, it's going to crack again. There's just literally no way around it. Now, once that section was cut out, I used the carbide burr tool to groove the section out, which increases the surface area of fresh weld to lay down, thus making it stronger. This section here on the side is so thin that there's basically nothing to weld it to, so I just completely removed it, and I'll fill it all back in with fresh metal. Unfortunately, being that this is a tight space, I couldn't get the camera in for an awesome arc shot, but that's when I did fill it all back up. But this next shot, I did get it in there with the arc shot, and it's really important that you follow along with this particular step. Now watch carefully here. Now I'm going to mow this over just the same as we did before. we got to push a lot of the impurities and a lot of the junk out to the surface. But look just behind the torch there. You can see the formation of that crack, which means I didn't dig deep enough, at least as deep as I thought I should. But then pay attention to the right side of this weld. As I back the torch up here, if you look really carefully, we get another crack that's starting to form here. And as I go and blend this back in, you'll see that these cracks that keep on popping back up to the surface, these are called hot short cracks, or just hot cracking. What happens is there's still a void left underneath the metal to where the top, when it solidifies, the stress is so high that it just cracks again. Now, it's really important that we keep mowing this over because it's going to tell me one very important thing, and that is when it's time to add filler. So once I have it all blended back in and it doesn't crack on me, then it's ready for the filler. Now, adding the filler is going to be just the same as I did before. The first pass is going to be right down the center of this one, and I'm going to burn it in really hot, and I'm going to push a lot of filler in there. Now, I'm going to be watching this at the same time to make sure that all the kinds of impurities and junk and stuff like that fill back up, but more importantly, that it doesn't crack. Now, if I do see it cracking, I have to go back and cut it back out again. There's just no way around it. Otherwise, it's gonna, the whole part's just going to fail again. These first three passes are probably the most important ones, as these are going to be the majority of our strength. So I'm making sure, once again, to blend them in nice and hot. So very heavy on my amps and quite a bit of filler. But again, smaller filler to control the amount of deposition I get out of it. These subsequent passes, which I'm just going to speed up here, all of these are just to fill the top back in. Now, they're not, again, not meant to be like pretty or anything else like that. We're just adding more metal, so that way we can take it all back away, grind it, and blend it, and everything else like that. These are not necessarily structural. They're just there for filling it. And of course, once all of that is finished here, this is pretty much what it looks like. It's not the most gorgeous thing in the entire world, but again, it's all going to get ground back down, so... Not much to worry about. So with it all welded up, I'm going to go set it aside while I knock out these holes on the other part. I realize now that I forgot to mention this part is chrome plated, and we can't weld through that. Now the grinder takes care of the chrome on the outside, but it definitely won't reach the inside of these holes. So the only solution to get rid of the chrome inside of the hole is to drill it out just a little bit bigger. Now, there's really no need to go all the way through on this one, just enough to catch any of that chrome that's left on the threads. The second step is to chamfer the hole slightly, which also helps to break the chrome off the edge before I remove it later with the grinder. Now filling up a hole is pretty straightforward. Just walk the torch around the outside and slowly work your way in. But I actually kind of rushed this one. Actually, I rushed both of them. And you can see after taking them down and attempting to blend them that there are some pinholes around the edges. I'm just going to have to suck it up and go back and fix this. This is actually from not waiting long enough to get all the junk and everything else to purge out of it before adding filler, so that's why there's a bunch of pinholes in it. Before attempting to fix them, I might as well take down the rest of this repair in case I need to go back and weld it back up again. Now my process for taking it down is pretty simple. Only three tools are needed. First thing I did was hit it with the flap disc. Now the flap disc takes the majority of the metal down to a uniform height, but it's not for blending it into the parent metal. Now, I realize it often looks like I take it all the way down, but there's literally fractions of material remaining above the surface. And that's just years of experience and practice to get it just right. The sander is used for blending. Any grit paper is usually what I use to make sure that the surface is nice and smooth to the touch. No undercutting around the toes of the bead, no high spots, no low spots. Once the sanding is done, the flap drum will lightly remove the sandpaper marks as well as reveal any final low or high spots. Now on parts that aren't chrome plated, it usually helps to restore the finish, like as if there's like a sanding or directional grain or anything on that finish. That's where it also comes in handy. But in this case, it's just for the final blending. Now with it looking the way that I want to, I went back over the holes again. But this time I made sure to slow down and let that junk escape before filling back in. 
Once the part cooled, I repeated the same steps to blend and finish. And these parts are good to go and I'm really happy with the final reveal. Now, since I do not offer chrome services, these will have to be sent out for that. And of course, the shop that handles that will build a customer accordingly. Now, the total time I have to repair this is a bit more than most because there was quite a bit of time spent prepping and blending to get it just right. I spent 49 minutes total on both of these parts, which is $81 in labor. Now, I do often read my comments, and a lot of people are confused about why I neglect to include certain expenses into the weld repair. So let's go for a bonus round here and figure out exactly how much this weld costs me to make. Seven minutes were spent welding. You do the math on that, it comes out to three cents for power consumption. Actually, less. The two and a half pieces of filler I used to weld this back together cost me 12 and a half cents after you do the math on it. And of course the argon running for that amount of time comes out to 28 cents. Now I didn't bother counting the grinder because all the time that it was running it hit my pocketbook for less than one penny. The cordless tools can't really be quantified either because you'd have to calculate how long it actually went to charge the battery versus how much you used and that's almost impossible. And of course the compressor cost me five cents for running it for 16 minutes. That's a total cost of... 48 and a half cents. I think the $81 charged will cover that. And of course, my other monthly expenses like utilities, rent, and you know, all that other stuff, they're pulled from my hourly rate, which is what I use to determine my hourly rate. So there you have it. One flawless weld repair. I'll see you guys on the next episode.